Hello, I'm Dan Schillinger of the Humanities Program, and I'm delighted to deliver the first HNP lecture of the spring term on Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli revolutionized political thought by analyzing political life in light of what he called the effectual truth, the truth redefined in terms of power. His writings both explain and enact the effectual truth, since Machiavelli wrote to transform his political world. Remember, by contrast, Plato and Augustine. In their view, the best city is a pattern laid up in heaven. In actual cities, philosophers and saints are powerless if they are not persecuted. So far was Socrates from ruling as a philosopher king that he was put to death by the Athenians. Augustine makes much the same point in his grisly account of the Christian martyrs at the beginning of the city of God. Machiavelli imagines for himself and for the philosophers of the future a very different fate. Look at the preface to his Discourses on Livy, page 82 of our Hackett edition. Quote, Men are by nature envious. It has always been as dangerous to propose new ways of thinking and new institutions as it is to seek unknown oceans and undiscovered continents. People are much quicker to criticize than to praise what others have done. Nevertheless, spurred on by an instinctive desire, I have always had to do those things that I believe will further the common good and benefit everybody. I have refused to be intimidated. I have resolved to set out on a road no one has traveled before me. My journey may be tiresome and difficult, but I can hope it will prove rewarding at least if people are willing to judge sympathetically the purpose of my labors. Writing in the so-called Age of Exploration, 20 years after Columbus set sail, Machiavelli casts himself as an explorer. He has discovered new political ideas and institutions. For his writings, he hopes that he may be rewarded. Machiavelli's characterization of his literary endeavor also evokes the political founders he so admires. Whatever the truth about Machiavelli's legacy, notice the task that he proposes for himself and for theory to found new political worlds. Who was Machiavelli? Niccolo Machiavelli was born in 1469 and he died in 1527. He was an Italian political philosopher and statesman. Rather, he would have said that he was a citizen of Florence and he served the Florentine Republic as the city's top advisor on matters of war. You could say that he was secretary of state. But after the fall of the Republic and the restitution of the Medici monarchy in 1512, Machiavelli as a former Republican official was tortured, banished to the countryside, and forced to turn to his true vocation, political philosophy. In the five years that followed, he wrote his two masterworks, first The Prince in 1513, then The Discourses on Livy about five years later. He also wrote histories, comedies, poems, and brilliant letters, some of which are so dirty you could not pay me to read them to you. In fact, he signed his letters Machiavelli, historian, comedian, and tragedian. He, if anyone, was a Renaissance man. More than any other political philosopher, Machiavelli's reputation precedes him, and his reputation isn't exactly sterling. Machiavelli has become infamous. Have you heard the word Machiavellian used as an epithet? What does it mean to call a political leader Machiavellian? Conniving, unscrupulous, deceitful, ready to do whatever it takes to get the better of his enemies, not to mention his friends. Here's an example of Machiavelli's infamy. People sometimes refer to the devil as Old Nick. Do you know where the devil got that nickname? That's right, from Old Niccolo Machiavelli. Examples of Machiavellian characters in this sense also abound in literature. Think of Milton Satan and Shakespeare's Macbeth. Finally, don't Machiavellians crop up frequently in contemporary TV and film too? My favorite examples are Frank Underwood in House of Cards, Terence Fletcher in the Damien Chazelle film Whiplash, 
and the Italian greyhound named Machiavelli, usually called Mac in the cartoon Clifford the Big Red Dog, uh, which my toddler likes. Where there's smoke, there's fire. It's not for nothing that the devil takes his name from Machiavelli. Yet as one reader of Machiavelli has remarked, it is a profound theological truth that the devil is a fallen angel. In other words, we can respect Machiavelli, we can learn from him, even as we remain wary of and disturbed by his thought. Here's what many people have learned from Machiavelli, a certain honesty or realism about how politics works. I'll give you an example from the American political tradition, that of James Madison. When Madison writes in Federalist 51, which we'll read later this term, that ambition must be made to counteract ambition, that government is necessary because men are not angels, that men act out of self-interest as opposed to better motives, he sounds a lot like Machiavelli, who points out in the third chapter of the Discourses that whoever lays down laws for a republic must assume that men are bad. By emphasizing what we actually do, rather than what we should do or what we say we do, Machiavelli inaugurated a fundamental shift in thinking about politics that continues to shape modernity. Let's turn to the text of The Prince. But first, a word about my plan. This lecture will focus on The Prince, proceeding through the text from beginning to end. Throughout, however, I'll refer to relevant passages from the discourses. In my view, and for reasons that I'll explain, the two texts are complementary. At first blush, the prince appears utterly conventional. Isn't the prince a practical guide to princely rule written by Machiavelli for Lorenzo de' Medici, the ruler of Florence? Doesn't the dedicatory letter that precedes the book give us this impression? Machiavelli writes that he desires to give Lorenzo, quote, obedient service. That is why he sends to Lorenzo his own greatest possession, his knowledge of ancient and modern politics, boiled down to one slim volume, uh, which the busy Lorenzo can read in an afternoon. And Machiavelli suggests that even if most princes would prefer to receive gifts of jewels or horses, Lorenzo should grasp the superior usefulness of Machiavelli's gift. And yet, what's the tone of this letter? Do we have reason to question its sincerity? I have already mentioned that Machiavelli was tortured by the Medici for a graphic description, see Wooten's introduction to our volume. Notice, in addition, what Machiavelli says about dedications in the letter that precedes the discourses on page 81, last line of that page, quote, Moreover, I have avoided adopting the normal practice of authors, for they nearly always dedicate their books to some ruler, and, blinded by ambition and avarice, they praise him as if he had at all possible virtuous qualities, when they ought to criticize him for having every despicable characteristic. Wait, that's exactly what Machiavelli does in The Prince. More precisely, while Machiavelli refrains from criticizing Lorenzo's despicable characteristics, he also fails to name Lorenzo's virtuous qualities. Look at the end of the letter, uh, the dedicatory letter uh, preceding the prince, page six, quote, I therefore beg your magnificence to accept this little gift in the spirit in which it is sent. If you read it carefully and think over what it contains, you will achieve the greatness your good fortune and your other fine qualities seem to hold out to you. Your good fortune and your other fine qualities. Why is that a strange thing to say? Because as we will see, fortune is not a quality, according to Machiavelli. Machiavelli distinguishes fortune throughout the book um, um, from human agency. Fortune lies outside human agency, um, while virtue um, um, refers to efficacious human agency. Fortune is always opposed to virtue. Put it this way, if you were to write a course evaluation for me that said, Professor Schillinger is lucky to have a job at Yale, though I'm sure he has many fine qualities, well, let me tell you, I would not take that as a compliment. Uh, please don't do it. 
The rhetorical complexity of the dedicatory letter reflects the rhetorical complexity of the prince. In the letter, at one and the same time, Machiavelli sets himself up as an unscrupulous advisor out to make a buck, as a Republican parodying the ineptitude and greed of princes, and as a political philosopher who offers an original account of political things, ancient and modern. Returning to the letter one last time, on page six, Machiavelli likens himself to a landscape painter employing the new Renaissance invention of perspective. As a man of the people, down in the valleys of political life, Machiavelli has the proper perspective from which to paint the nature of the princes who inhabit the peaks. Of course, since the book contains many observations about the people as well, Machiavelli looks down um, he doesn't only look up. On the page, at least, he is a prince as well as a man of the people. The landscape metaphor returns in chapter 14 of The Prince, on page 47 of our edition, where Machiavelli tells us that the Achaean captain, Philippemon, was a master of the art of war because even in peacetime, he rode through the countryside, over peaks and through valleys, imagining how he would fight battle in these various sites across all different types of terrain. In The Prince, Machiavelli paints the scenes required for this kind of mental training. His strategic rhetoric inculcates certain virtues, especially a certain type of prudence or judgment when the reader thinks through Machiavelli's particular examples when he travels the terrain of the text um, in the manner of Philippemon. Chapter one, Machiavelli's taxonomy of political forms is notable for what it omits. He writes, all states, all forms of government that have had and continue to have authority over men have been and are either republics or principalities. Okay, among principalities, Machiavelli draws distinctions. They can be inherited, conquered, seized from within, or founded anew, either with the prince's own soldiers or with external forces, either through fortune or through virtue. Missing from this analysis is any mention of justice or the common good, Aristotle's distinction between correct and deviant regimes, between monarchy and tyranny, for example, is impossible within this framework. On a more general level, Machiavelli emphasizes the beginning of the political community as opposed to its end. Like a conqueror, he is interested in the acquisition of states, not in their ethical purposes, distributions of offices, or ways of life. Chapter two treats heredit hereditary principalities, and it seems to deliver good news to Lorenzo. The hereditary prince maintains his state easily, says Machiavelli, since his subjects are accustomed to the ruling family. Phew, says Lorenzo, and perhaps he closes the book. Going forward, Machiavelli focuses on new principalities, principalities not inherited, but acquired. He also immediately undercuts his comforting message to Lorenzo. At the beginning of chapter three, on page seven, Machiavelli writes, Quote, people willingly change their rulers. In this chapter on mixed principalities, new principalities added to an extant state through conquest, Machiavelli examines the failure of King Louis XII of France to acquire and maintain his conquests in Italy. In so doing, he shows the next conqueror of his beloved Italy how to do it better. What should the conqueror do? Well, he should follow certain nasty rules of thumb, eliminate the bloodline of rulers in conquered states, divide and conquer by befriending weaker powers, frustrate the machinations of other imperial powers, establish colonies in strategic locations, and behind all these particular rules of thumb lies a general rule that Machiavelli lays out at the bottom of page nine and which he says hardly or never fails. The rule is caress or crush, quote, people should either be caressed or crushed. Louis did not understand this rule. Look at page 12. Louis made friends, that is alliances with everyone, 
first with weaker Italian states, such as the Venetians, then with imperial powers, such as the church and Spain, who solicited his help, but really wanted to usurp him. Eventually, he turned on the weaker powers at the request of the larger. He should have done the opposite. Machiavelli comments near the bottom of page 12, he, Louis, did not realize that by this decision to aid the Pope in particular, he weakened himself, alienating his friends and those who had flung themselves into his arms, and at the same time strengthened the church, adding to its already extensive spiritual authority and increased temporal power. Or, as Machiavelli claims that he himself remarked to a certain French cardinal on page 14 near the end of the chapter, um, and maybe it's worth noting at this point that he presumably had this conversation as the Florentine um, secretary in matters of war. Um, he, he really did meet many of these people, such um, as Cesare Borgia. Um, in any case, he claims that he remarked to a certain French cardinal on page 14 near the end of the chapter, quote, the French do not understand politics, for if they did, they would not allow the church to acquire so much power. Why the Catholic Louis XII failed to treat Pope Alexander VI as an enemy is clear, especially since Louis needed Alexander to, to annul his marriage. Louis's faith, his tendency to make friends and keep promises, especially with the Pope and other Catholics like the King of Spain, leads him to cede his conquests in Italy to the church, which under Alexander aims at conquest itself. Yet chapter three isn't simply critical. Machiavelli also holds up for imitation a certain faithless state, a state that's worthy um, to be imitated by conquerors. What state is that? Isn't it Rome, ancient Republican pagan Rome? Although Machiavelli began chapter two by promising that he would not discuss republics in this book, having discussed them at length in another place. I guess that's the discourses. In fact, Machiavelli discusses republics and the prince just as he discusses princes and the discourses. Anyway, whereas Louis readily caressed but hesitated to crush, the Roman Republic waged offensive expansionist warfare continuously. Every Roman caress prepared for a crushing blow. Rome made friends only to conquer them, at least on Machiavelli's telling. At the beginning of the discourses, in the sixth chapter, on page 101 of our volume, we learn, in fact, that Machiavelli admires Rome above all other republics, ancient and modern, precisely on account of its imperialism. He says, one is obliged to copy the Roman model of constant imperial expansion. Um, this again is at the bottom of page 101. Only thus can a republic avoid its own conquest or corruption. Let's move on. Chapter four is obscure. If you want to understand it, you'll have to think about how it maps onto Italy. As for chapter five, Machiavelli again breaks his promise not to discuss republics. Chapter five hardly seems to have been written by someone who sympathizes with Republican rule, rule in which the people play a significant part, since Machiavelli advises princes who conquer republics to destroy them. Why, however, must a prince destroy a conquered republic? Um, ostensibly, it's because the Republican love of freedom, of popular self-government, never dies and always threatens the prince. Form, citizen, people who are used to being citizens of a republic aren't going to accept princely rule. They're going to conspire against the prince. Is there a way, though, for the prince to harness this energetic spirit of freedom? Hold this thought. Chapter 6. Of new principalities that are acquired through one's own arms and virtue. Here we learn that the greatest princes in memory were new princes rather than hereditary princes, and that they took power through their own arms and virtue, not through fortune and the arms of others. Let's make these abstract points more concrete. Who are Machiavelli's greatest princes? What exactly did they do? Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus are not simply political leaders. They are founders. 
they founded states that had not previously existed. In this way, they differ from Machiavelli's contemporaries, such as Francesco Sforza, who Machiavelli calls a new prince in the first chapter of the work because Sforza conquered Milan and made it his own. Yet Sforza evidently falls short of the greatest examples since he did not found Milan. And in any case, Milan is small potatoes. Romulus, Moses, Cyrus, and Theseus founded huge and enduring imperial civilizations. In Machiavelli's language, on page 19 of our text, they founded new institutions and customs, or more literally, new modes and orders. Romulus founded Rome, Theseus Athens, Cyrus Persia, and Moses Israel. You might even suppose that Moses is a kind of honorary founder of every people guided by the three biblical religions, all of which assume uh, the truth of the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Among these examples, though, Moses sticks out like a sore thumb. Why? Because Romulus, Theseus, and Cyrus committed atrocious crimes. We know from Livy that Romulus killed his brother, an action that Machiavelli excuses in the ninth chapter of the Discourses, page 108 of our edition, on the grounds that a founder must be one alone. According to Plutarch, Theseus killed 25 brothers in one fight and took their sister as his concubine. Remember from Herodotus that were it not for some timely rain, Cyrus would have burned, would have burned Croesus alive along with 14 Lydian children. How does Moses fit with these warlords? Page 19, toward the top, quote, but let us discuss Cyrus and the others who have acquired existing kingdoms or founded new ones. You will find them all admirable. And if you look at the actions and strategies of each one of them, you will find that they do not significantly differ from those of Moses who could not have had a better teacher. The pagan generals Cy Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus do not differ from Moses, whose teacher was God. By implication, Moses did not require such a teacher and did not have one. Moses saw an opportunity in the enslavement of the Israelites, and he seized it. He is presented as fundamentally similar to the others, a founder and a creator of a unified people through his own arms and virtue. He saw a people suffering, dispersed, enslaved, and realized that he could uh, bring them together and found a new state. Machiavellian reason replaces divine revelation. Observing how political life works, Machiavelli reasons backward to what Moses must have done in order to found Israel. There was no burning bush, no divine revelation of the law, only a virtuous founder who relied on himself. However, in the second half of the chapter, on page 20, there is another term that Machiavelli uses to refer to these founders. What is it? Armed prophets. Having assimilated Moses to Theseus, sorry, having assimilated Moses to Theseus, Cyrus, and Romulus, Machiavelli turns around in the second half of the chapter and assimilates the pagan founders to the biblical prophet. What's his point? As a political leader, you need to win hearts and minds. You need to have a teaching, and you need to articulate that teaching with the force of prophecy. Still, in the formula armed prophets, the element of arms appears to be most important, as Machiavelli says that all unarmed prophets have been ruined. As an example of an unarmed prophet who is ruined, Machiavelli gives us the Christian preacher Girolamo Savonarola, a man who in fact claimed to be a prophet in the traditional sense, and whose brief rule of Machiavelli's hometown of Florence came to an end in 1498, when Savonarola was hanged and burned at the stake. Um, these Renaissance Italians did not mess around. Of whom does Savonarola remind you? Again, Machiavelli offers an, inf an invidious comparison between the Christian present and the pagan past. In the Discourses, Book 2, Chapter 2, page 168 of our edition, Machiavelli writes more explicitly, 
that the difference between antiquity and modernity, quote, is rooted in the difference between our religion and theirs. Our religion glorifies men who are humble and contemplative rather than those who do great deeds. He goes on, this set of values has turned men of our day into weaklings and left them unable to defend themselves against the ravages of the wicked. The wicked have no difficulty in handling their fellow men for they know the average individual wants rather to endure their blows than to strike back for he hopes to go to heaven. Machiavelli's merciless critique of Christian worldlessness and passivism explains his disdain for his contemporaries and his admiration of the ancients. Whereas the central tension in classical political thought inheres in the relation of politics to philosophy, the central tension in Machiavelli's political thought, and perhaps in the political thought of his early modern followers, inheres in the relation between politics and religion the state, and the church. This tension comes to the fore in the following chapter, chapter 7, which concerns new principalities acquired through fortune. The protagonist of the chapter is Cesare Borgia, son of Pope Alexander VI. Is the Pope supposed to have a kid? As the contemporary Italian who most closely, closely approaches the virtue of Machiavelli's ancient exemplars, Cesare enjoys a special status in the work. Machiavelli says on page 22, I cannot think of any better example I could offer a new ruler than that of his actions, that is Cesare's. In particular, Machiavelli highlights Cesare's treatment of his minister, Ramiro de Orco, as an action worthy of imitation. After ordering Ramiro to terrorize the citizens of the Romagna, a territory recently acquired by Cesare and Pope Alexander VI, in order to consolidate their rule, Cesare turned on Ramiro. Bottom of page 24. One morning in the town square, he had Ramiro de Orco's corpse laid out in two pieces with a chopping board and a bloody knife beside it. These are Machiavelli's words. This ferocious sight made the people of the Romagna simultaneously happy and dumbfounded. Like the armed prophets of chapter six, Cesare uses arms to entrench his rule, to inspire fear, to establish his new institutions. However, unlike them, Cesare failed to maintain his conquests. Machiavelli reveals in chapter 11 of The Prince, page 37, that Pope Alexander, Alexander, quote, brought about all those things that I have mentioned above when discussing the achievements of Duke Valentino, Cesare Borgia. Whereas the armed prophets of chapter six relied on their own arms and virtue, Cesare relied on fortune and the arms of others, his father and the church. His reliance on the church was a mistake, as Machiavelli makes clear at the end of chapter 7, page 27. After the death of his father, Pope Alexander VI, Cesare allowed an enemy cardinal to be elected pope, namely Pope Julius II. Machiavelli comments, if he, Cesare, imagined recent gestures of goodwill make the powerful forget old injuries, he was much mistaken. Cesare, like Louis XII of chapter 3, was stuck between the religion of universal love and the art of war, between faith and faithlessness. As Machiavelli puts the point in the Discourses, chapter 27 of book 1, page 132 of our edition, men do not know how to be either admirably wicked or completely good. In that same chapter of the Discourses, Machiavelli reproves a certain tyrant, Baglioni, for allowing himself to be dethroned by Pope Julius II. Machiavelli writes, Baglioni had a legitimate opportunity, but to tell the truth he did not dare, though he would have won eternal fame for being the first person to show the clergy just how little one should respect people who live and govern as they do. He could have done something whose grandeur would have more than compensated for any disgrace or any danger that might have resulted from it. 
what is Machiavelli's shockingly wicked suggestion here? That Baglioni should have killed the Pope, that he should have destroyed the whole college of cardinals. Likewise, Cesare failed to get out from under the thumb of the church. If anything, his gains were its gains. The title of chapter eight is surprising. Had Machiavelli mentioned principalities acquired through wickedness as a type of principality in chapter one? Evidently, the taxonomy of principalities in chapter one is not exhaustive. Or maybe it is. Could it be the case that Machiavellian virtue allows or even requires wickedness? That is the question posed by Machiavelli's ascription of virtue to the Syracusan tyrant Agathocles, about whom he seems to say, at one and the same time, that he is and is not virtuous. One scholar comments on this chapter, quote, Machiavelli has not presented the example of Agathocles in order to pacify his readers, but to try them. In other words, have you learned the lesson of chapter 7 of Cesare Borgia, whom Machiavelli calls virtuous precisely because he cut Ramiro in half and so consolidated his rule over the Romagna? Or do you cling to outmoded notions of virtue according to which virtue is yoked to ethical ends such as justice and honesty, ends that exclude cutting a guy in half? Machiavelli is testing you. Chapter 9 also appears to introduce a type of principality unaccounted for in the taxonomy of Chapter 1, the principality that elects a citizen to rule, elective monarchy. One might wonder dismally whether we live in such a principality. Anyway, again, I would suggest that Machiavelli is not violating the plan laid out in Chapter 1 so much as he is teasing out surprising implications of that plan. The surprise here is that the prince needs the support of the people. If tyranny means autocratic rule over unwilling subjects, then Machiavelli does not recommend tyranny. For the prince should curry favor with the people. To put the point anachronistically and evocatively, the prince should be a populist, decrying and perhaps even persecuting rival elites while, champion while championing and empowering ordinary people. For elites threaten the power of the prince, and they can be replaced, while the prince needs the people to be ready to fight and die on his behalf. What this means, more concretely, is that the prince should found a principality with republican elements, if not simply a republic. Um, those elements uh, can be institutions, for example, like the Roman tribunes of the plebs, which Machiavelli presents um, in, in the Discourses, Book 1, Chapter 3, on pages 92 to 93 of our edition, as an institutional innovation that perfected the Roman constitution. Machiavelli is a big fan of the tribunate. So too, in the next chapter of the Discourses on page 49, he defends Roman tumults, the people removing to the Sacred Mount, for example, which we, we remember from Livy, as a necessary cost borne by any city that wants to be able to rely on the people in war. The demands of princely rule thought through entail arming and empowering the people, that is, founding a republic. At the same time, Machiavelli suggests in the discourses that republics will always require princely founders, dictators, and refounders. For example, in Discourse 1-9, um, that is the ninth discourse of the first book, Machiavelli argues that a founder of any state must always be one alone, as was Romulus after the murder of Remus. In Discourse 133, 33rd, Discourse of the first book, he defends the Roman institution of the dictatorship, quote, for without such an institution, he says near the top of page 138, it is impossible for the cities to cope with exceptional events. Finally, in the third book of the discourses, especially in the 31st discourse of that book, the last passage that I had you read, Machiavelli extols Marcus Furius Camillus as the princely refounder of Rome, casting him as a second Romulus. Just as the prince recommends an armed and empowered populace, 
So the discourses emphasizes the importance of princely rule in a Republican context. Returning to the prince, chapter 10 is almost as obscure as chapter 24, sorry, as chapter four. And I've said what I want to say about chapter 11 on ecclesiastical principalities in my remarks on Cesare Borgia and Pope Alexander VI. So let's turn to chapters 12 through 14, which extend and deepen the proto-Republican argument of chapter nine, even as they introduce a new subject. Having laid out the various kinds of principalities in the book's first 11 chapters, Machiavelli uses these central chapters, 12 through 14, to offer his military advice. That advice can be reduced to a formula. Rely on your own troops, never auxiliary troops loaned to you by a foreign power or mercenary troops who fight for pay. Why had the Italians come to rely on mercenary and auxiliary soldiers? See chapter 12, page 41, near the bottom of the page. Quote, so Italy came to be more or less divided up between those who owed allegiance to the Pope and a number of independent Republican city-states. Since neither the priests nor the citizens of the republics were accustomed to fighting wars, they began to employ foreigners in their armies. In short, priests don't fight where priests rule, mercenaries, and auxiliaries must abound. In the first place, then, Machiavelli's military advice is to arm one's citizens. Yet the states Machiavelli holds up for imitation are republics, Rome and Sparta in the ancient world, and the Swiss in the modern. How, after all, is it possible to arm the people without giving them a role in government? That seems to be the point um, of these chapters, chapters 12 through 14, um, at least uh, implicitly, it's explicitly the point of the first six chapters of the discourses. Yet Machiavelli's military advice also has an ethical dimension. In his discussion of the biblical David in chapter 13, page 44, Machiavelli extols David for meeting the giant Goliath with only his sling and his knife, that is, for relying on his own arms. This heretical retelling of the story flies in the face of the biblical narrative, where David relies on and triumphs on account of his faith in God. To rely on one's own arms, then, means both relying on one's own armies and relying on oneself. Self-reliance, especially intellectual self-reliance, comprises the core of Machiavellian virtue. In this way, one can make sense of two curious later chapters, chapters 22 and 23, on advice giving, in which Machiavelli appears to say that advice giving is impossible because those dumb enough to need advice can't distinguish good advice from bad, while those smart enough to decide for themselves don't need it. Rather than deliver static pieces of advice, Machiavelli himself strategically creates a textual world in which the reader can develop his or her own intellectual self-reliance. Again, think of Philippemen in chapter 14, practicing the art of war through conversation about geographical sites. That's what you're doing with the text of the prince. Chapter 15, like chapter six, is a peak of the work. Machiavelli begins the chapter by trumpeting his originality. As in the preface to the discourses, Machiavelli claims that he departs from all others on no less a subject than the substance of human virtue. He sneers at thinkers like Plato and Augustine who define virtue in light of imaginary principalities, Callipolis and the city of God. By contrast, Machiavelli affirms on page 48 that he will, quote, go straight to a discussion of how things are in real life. On a more literal translation, he says that he will go straight to the effectual truth of the matter, forgetting the imagination of it. What is the effectual truth, Machiavelli's standard? It is the truth redefined in terms of power the truth that works, the truth that gets results, the truth that has an effect on the world. 
the effectual truth of modern physics is an F-18. The effectual truth of a Yale education is a six-figure consulting job at age 22. How much is the truth worth, after all, if it is inert, powerless, unable to transform the world? In what spirit does Machiavelli redefine virtue as efficacious power? In a spirit of weary resignation, answer some commentators, for them, the problem is merely one of dirty hands. Lamentably, political realities make ethical or religious purity impossible, though we may wish it were otherwise. Is this what Machiavelli means? Look at the last lines of the chapter on page 49. Here's what Machiavelli says. Do not be upset if you are supposed to have those vices a ruler needs if he is going to stay securely in power, for if you think about it, you will realize there are some ways of behaving that are supposed to be virtuous, but would lead to your downfall, and others that are supposed to be wicked, but will lead to your welfare and peace of mind. Machiavelli cheerfully asserts that when one takes for one standard the effectual truth, the truth redefined in terms of power, one realizes that many of the so-called vices are in fact virtues. Whatever modes of action increase power, wealth, and glory, these are virtuous. In fact, this transvaluation of the virtues eliminates the problem of dirty hands altogether, as the prince no longer needs to have a bad conscience about acting efficaciously, yet immorally. Like Thrasymachus of Plato's Republic, Machiavelli suggests that tyrants and conquerors sleep easy because justice enjoys neither natural nor divine support. In chapters 16 through 21, Machiavelli applies this general lesson, examining particular virtues and exemplars. Chapter 16 shows us that um, stinginess, uh, meanness, works better than generosity, which consumes itself and leads to hatred, unless one is generous with with the goods that one has stolen through imperial conquests, like Caesar was. Chapter 17 proposes notoriously that it is better to be feared than loved. And while Machiavelli initially says that one should aim to be both feared and loved, he eventually presents Hannibal on pages 52 and 53 as a general whose limitless cruelty terrified his soldiers to great effect. Hannibal was successful, and he was simply cruel. Chapter 18 adapts a Ciceronian parable for Machiavellian purposes. Princes should be foxy and leonine, cunning and brutal, in a word, beastly. They should act as if schooled by a centaur, a mythical creature known for its cleverness, bellicosity, and sexuality. Machiavellian virtue dispenses with justice and moderation, while courage and prudence remain, courage becomes boldness and prudence becomes cleverness. Machiavelli sums up on page 55 in chapter 18. So if a ruler wins wars and holds on to power, the means he has employed will always be judged honorable and everyone will praise them. The common man accepts external appearances and judges by the outcome, and when it comes down to it, only the masses count. Although many people would say that the ends justifies the means, describes the ethic of the Machiavellian prince, surely you've heard that before, what Machiavelli in fact says is that you, all of us hold this belief, the ends justifies the means, insofar as we revere winners, whatever their crimes. He had already said as much back in chapter 3, page 13. You should remember this line. I think it's, it's characteristic and important. Quote, it is perfectly natural and normal to want to acquire new territory, and whenever men do what will succeed toward this end, they will be praised, or at least not condemned. Chapter 19 is extremely complex. We'll skip it, noting only in passing that on page 61, Machiavelli seems to hold up the cruel Roman emperor Septimius Severus for praise that rivals his praise of the founders of chapter 6. 
Chapter 20's central point is that the well-armed populace is the greatest fortress. That's a kind of metaphorical point. Chapter 21 offers another cruel and wicked example, a modern example, a man who used Christianity as civil religion, um, namely the King of Spain, Ferdinand, Ferdinand of Aragon, um, whom uh, you might consider with Septimius Severus um, alongside the founders of chapter six. Chapters 22 and 23 are those paradoxical chapters on advice giving, which I mentioned in the context of Machiavelli's military advice in chapters 12 through 14. Advice giving, paradoxically, in a book bristling with advice is impossible, yet education to self-reliance is possible with the right teacher and the right rhetoric. Chapter 24 signals a new topic, how the princes of Italy have lost their states, that topic is taken up in chapter 26, the final chapter, where Machiavelli calls for the Medici to liberate Italy from the barbarians. Liberating Italy means conquering Italy, since neither the Florentines nor the church, which is being led at this time by a Medici Pope, Leo X, rules the entirety of Italy. Um, that's, sorry, that's to say neither the church um, nor um, uh, the Flor nor Florence rules the entirety of Italy, so um, to unite Italy would mean conquering it. Who are the barbarians from which Italy requires liberation after its unification through conquest? Machiavelli has strongly implied in this book, and he says directly in the discourses, that the church is responsible for Italy's division and ruin. While the last chapter of The Prince is a patriotic and practical call for the unification of Italy, it is also ambiguous and evocative. For example, in its use of imagery from Exodus, can Italy really expect a new Moses? Is Machiavelli really hopeful um, for the unification of Italy and its liberation from the barbarians, whoever they are? If chapter 26 is a kind of coda, because it is so rhetorical and practical, we arrive at the final chapter of the book proper, chapter 25, and at the final segment of this lecture. Chapter 25 treats fortune and its relation to virtue. Machiavelli offers his own distinctive perspective on fortune in a vivid image on pages 74 to 75. Fortune is a torrential flooding river but one that can be channeled through well-constructed barriers, dikes, and dams. What does Machiavelli mean? Let me put it to you this way. Many rivers, like the Nile in Egypt, flood every year after the rainy season. One can imagine that certain ancient peoples had not discovered this fact, and that they lived in fear of the rivers that sustained them, attributing their sudden floods to bad luck or to the gods. But as soon as they figured out that the flooding could be predicted, not only did their fear dissipate, but they began to use the floodwaters to irrigate their crops, as the Egyptians did. To put the point in a more philosophical register, for Machiavelli, fortune represents the ambiguous relation of nature to human happiness prior to the emancipation of human power over and against nature. Everything depends on us. If we take steps to prepare for bad luck, if we build barriers, dams, and channels, then bad luck dissipates like a figment of the imagination. That everything depends on us means that fortune isn't out there. Rather, it's an illusion, an excuse. I'll give you another example to hammer the point home. Imagine you have an essay for this course due next class. Just before class, you're finishing the essay when your computer dies completely. It's done, kaput. Man, you'll say, what bad luck. But as a good Machiavellian, you should have been prepared. You should have finished your essay with time to spare, and you would have had no problem. In the final section of the chapter, on pages 76 to 77, Machiavelli offers a second disturbing image of fortune. Fortune is a woman, a woman subjected to sexual violence. This image is really disturbing and offensive, no doubt. But I think it's worth thinking about because Machiavelli aims to disturb and to shock. 
and he disturbed and shocked readers in his own time too. Nobody thought this was okay. What is the point of this image? Whereas the Romans had viewed Fortuna as a goddess, Machiavelli cuts her down to size, presenting her as a woman. And insofar as Machiavelli advises the princely reader to treat this metaphorical woman in a way that no woman, no person should actually be treated, his point, it seems to me, is that all is fair in love and war. That's the shocking takeaway. While political leaders cannot fully control their circumstances or even their own natures, they can control whether they are overly traditional or conventional. As a rule of thumb, it works better to be innovative, to slough off shame and to pursue the new, to risk it, to flout convention, to be like the political 